One of the books that I uh, have read this week, uh, Nicholas Johnson's new book, Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. Nicholas Johnson uh, joins us on the program now. Uh, Professor Johnson, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for having me. And I'll apologize at the beginning. I'm nursing a little cold, so uh, if I sound a little gruff and gravelly, that's the reason. But just, uh, you, we'll get through it. All right. You sound you sound fantastic. It just gives you a little more character. All actually, right. Good. Just, you know. Um, listen, I have to say, first of all, I I thoroughly uh, in I don't know if enjoyed is the right word because there's some there's some painful stuff to read. Uh, there in is. This book, there's there's a lot of tough stuff, and I was telling someone the other day this was an easier book to write than it is to talk about. So so talk, doing some of this stuff out loud in conversation um, is is uncomfortable. Um, but I it was a it was a very compelling book. Uh, I will say that it was it was hard to put down, and I was uh, I was actually sad to see the uh, the book end because I, I thought you did a very a uh, very good job of of telling these stories that that frankly I think need to be told. Um, so let me ask you first of all, why did you decide that this book uh, was going to be something that you wanted to work on? Well, it's funny. You know, I've, I've been working on Second Amendment issues for for almost twenty years, and um, so you know, I, I'm a I'm a black law professor, and in, in, I work in New York City, but I was born in West Virginia, so I I was uh, you know always quite familiar with firearms, and started doing this work um, early on, uh, partly as a reaction to what I saw as a lack of attention. Uh, um, or a lack of serious attention in in the academy. So um, uh, now to answer your explicit question, um, if, if people would say, you know, how did you come to this stuff? Why are you doing this work? And and um, they came out of that, I think, from sort of the stereotype that uh, gun rights issues were uh, of interest only to a certain slice of the population. So what I wanted to do in the book was was to tell this long uh, history that that I knew. I mean, I, I grew up with this. I grew up in rural gun culture and. And uh, um, all of the people that I knew uh, owned firearms. Uh, everybody in my family owned firearms. They they were good, honest uh, people. The, you know, preachers and deacons and and uh, all of the the best people of the community. And so I, I wanted to tell that story because uh, when when I talk with with black gun owners, when I talk with people, um, you know, my my friends and relatives who are still at home who are gun owners, um, they uh, I think are sort of lament the fact that they. There is, is this sort of simplistic image of uh, gun ownership in popular culture, uh, and that image diminishes and, and, in fact, doesn't tell at all um, the the story from the perspective of uh, people like I knew growing up and people who I still know. So um, partly it was that, and partly it was that there are, as you said um, when you introduced the book, there are, are just tons of authentic American heroes in, in, in this story and in this book, and, and these are people that we all should know. Uh, all right. Um, I, I would, let, let's start at the beginning, actually, because um, one of the first things that uh, I was struck by is that uh, it, it seems gun control laws were just as ineffective in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries at preventing people from getting firearms as they are today. Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, I talk about this uh, often, and uh, I've done lots of scholarly work on it, and I, I tell people, uh, what, in fact, one of the most convincing things that, that uh, skeptics, I think, wrestle with uh, ultimately when um, I'm having these conversations is that, that once you, you tell people that Americans already own 325 <laughs> million guns, uh, the idea of supply controls uh, really sort of uh, is, is, is diminished, and, and people, uh, if they think hard about it, uh, sort of give up on it. Well, uh, Early on, uh, the access to to uh, firearms uh, by by uh, by blacks was was open enough that you have all of these stories early on in the book where uh, fugitive slaves are are acquiring firearms from from one source or another, often by theft, but uh, sometimes through actual trading with with merchants who were willing to trade contraband uh, to slaves. So in the in the second chapter of the book, um, it, it's filled with episodes where uh, fugitive slaves and free people were, were fighting off uh, slave catchers um, using firearms. 
homes, and and you know the, most of the times they 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 did not walk into um, you know, some store and buy them them legitimately. Mm-hmm. But what it suggests is that if you have a culture that is uh, where that any in an armed uh, society, uh, there will be uh, leakage from from the inventory into places where um, the, the powers that be are trying to keep firearms from going, and and that's just a practical fact of of the society we live in. All right, and so uh, you know, you you trace the again the long tradition of uh, self defense, and one of the things that I thought was so fascinating is when you get into. Uh, I figured this would have actually come up in the you know in the civil rights era in the 1950s and 1960s, but what I was kind of surprised to to learn is that this argument between uh, armed self defense and political violence. You you found in the, uh, the 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 I guess the politosphere those uh, th- those you know uh, thought leaders at the time sure. as far back as the eighteen seventies eighteen eighties oh sure it's happening early on and. Um, you know, to the degree that I've <clears throat> made any sort of independent uh, contribution here, um, it is in, in sort of the analytical insight um, that w- was clear to me early on, and and, and you know, was, as you said, it was clear in the 1950s, 1960s. There, there, there was and there is uh, this clear distinction between political violence and individual self-defense. So uh, quite clearly, you would see in the, the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, the black leadership uh, pursuing nonviolently the goals of, of, the, of the race, that is, uh, looking for political achievement and political advancement using nonviolent means. And um, there you get in the first chapter, this really powerful statement by Martin Luther King, which is, is a clear embrace, actually, of individual self-defense, individual self-defense even using firearms. But King goes on to say something that had long been true, and that is that we've got to make a clear distinction between individual self-defense and political violence, because p- uh, political violence is just is, is folly. Political violence is a nightmare. We're not going to achieve group goals through any kind of revolutionary violent enterprise. Well, that your instinct that that would come out of the 1950s actually is is uh, one that is is sound, except that the roots of that theme go back at least to um, the the late 19th century, where you saw uh, black newspaper editors and and uh, members of organizations that would later uh, fuel the w, the the NAACP. You see, uh, you know, W. E. E. B. Du Bois and and many 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 others uh, talking in detail about how. Um, Armed self-defense was legitimate and important, but on the other hand, uh, cautioning against turning uh, any episode of armed self-defense into something that looked like political violence, because political violence would generate backlash, political violence would harm uh, the the population as a whole. Um, I was also struck by, in the late 19th century, uh, Ida Wells and her advice that uh, every black uh, should own a Winchester rifle, which, as you describe, was the "quote unquote" assault weapon of the day. Well, and, and, and it's you know, Ida Wells for people who don't know her is, is such an unlikely person. I mean, I'm, I'm smiling as as you mention it because um, I'm just in. You know, there are lots of, of period images of, of Ida B. Wells, and people talk about. I'm not sure exactly how big she she was. Someone, you know, one reporter said that she was only about four foot eight. So wow. she's this this little little woman, uh, but she's just an absolute firebrand, and she was was sort of the, really the foremost uh, anti lynching activist of uh, the late um, 19th century. And uh, the quote that you're talking about was uh, Wells saying uh, something like, the Winchester rifle deserves a place of honor in every black home. And what she was was referring to, actually, was uh, a spate of averted lynchings. So one in Paducah, Kentucky, another in Florida, a couple of others, one in Georgia, someplace else, where um, the armed black men when you where the community mm-hmm. came to the defense of um, people who had been targeted for uh, targeted by lynch mobs and the so the reference to to the Winchester there was not just rhetorical and as you move through the book especially in in the late 19th early 20th century you see these continued references not just from Ida Wells but from lots and lots of other people um, you know a fellow named McCabe out in in Oklahoma um, who again 
again, you know, was urging blacks to, to emigrate west. And uh, you see all of these, these statements, really sort of uh, proud articulations of uh, gun ownership and um, you know, people sort of exercising their rights as, as citizens. Um, wedded to these references to the Winchester. And one of the things that I do is uh, in, in the book, uh, and you know, you'll, you'll see this sort of subtly coming through the book, uh, I talk about one of the early trials of uh, the Henry model Winchester uh, that, that talks about you know, the, sort of the rapid fire capability, et cetera, uh, in a way that shows that, um, that, that multi-shot technology is certainly not a, a new thing, and that what uh, Ida Wells was talking about was, was the clear utility of, of the 14-shot the uh, Henry Winchester in the context of someone who might be in a spot where they were alone uh, against a mob. And, in, and what she, she was, uh, was indicating is uh, the sort of concern that I, I think every you know, your, your listeners can appreciate it, and then when, when we have this conversation um, in the modern era about what sorts of guns people need and, mm-hmm. and what the boundary line should be between guns in common use and, and guns that, that are not. Um, it, it pays to, to look at these episodes and to think about uh, the technology that was uh, being deployed uh, by, by people uh, more than, than, than 100 years ago. I think it enriches the, the conversations that we're in the middle of now. I think you're absolutely correct about that. I mean, I'm just trying to picture Mayor Bloomberg telling Telling Ida Wells, hey, you only need seven rounds, and if I had it my way, you'd only have three. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it, it's funny. The the political class has has a different set of incentives here, and um, I, I've you know I've thought about this you know for, for years and, and tried to sort of empathize with with people who are um, um, you know in 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 the spot of saying that they've got a solution to a variety of these problems. Oh. Well, here, here's the, the one of the points of the book is to is to emphasize something that we already know, and that is that in places where we are are talking about uh, uh, the importance of self defense, we are talking about a sphere of, of of problems that the state, by definition, uh, cannot address. And and this is a hard thing, I think, especially for uh, progressive politicians to to embrace because the. The political coin of, of of that class really is to promise public solutions to a, a broad variety of, of things. But mm-hmm. uh, if you step back and think about you know the proper range of self defense, it's always that place where government can't respond. So it's it's just a curious thing to me uh, that that we always look immediately to what uh, public officials will say about these questions that ultimately are uh, are demanding uh, private. That action, that is, you know, just as a matter of physics, they're demanding private action. Absolutely. Uh, we're talking with Professor Nicholas Johnson, the uh, author of the new book, Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. Uh, and, you know, again, we, your book starts uh, a pre-Civil War, uh, and, I, again, I thought it was fascinating, uh, and I, I actually knew a little bit about this. I, I had read a book uh, not long ago called uh, Israel on the Appomattox, uh, which was about uh, Israel Hill, uh, in Virginia, John Randolph uh, owned a plantation. And you actually mentioned Randolph right. freeing a group of slaves who moved to Ohio. Another right. group stayed there in Virginia uh, and had a community of, uh, of free blacks up until the Civil War. Uh, and so this book had, had mentioned the, the ownership of arms and how it was very common for these free blacks to go hunting. And, you know, nobody, sure. nobody, nobody bothered them. Uh, I thought it was interesting that apparently that was at least somewhat true for some slaves, well, it's it's interesting. You know, as, as I went through this, and you know, the book could have been twice as long as as, as it is. Um, <laughs> Come out with an expanded version. Uh, well, you know, it's it's uh, right now. I'm, I'm trying to sort of hold on to the reins as as uh, people are <laughs> sort of interested in, in talking about uh, talking about what what is here. But the, so so one of the things that um, that we find is that. In in some of the early uh, legislation uh, under slavery, there were lots of restrictions on both slaves and free blacks. But as you look then into the exceptions that applied to some of those uh, uh, restrictions, you see that there were exceptions for um, blacks having guns 
One is, for example, if they're accompanied by um, um, a white person of at least 16 years of age. But another is uh, having guns for defense of the plantation and, and, and shooting uh, um, vermin and birds and so forth. And you even have, uh, after the Civil War in, in South Carolina, uh, another instance where um, there's, there's this meeting by a group of, of white planters, basically, and, and they're, they're fighting about uh, whether and how they're going to institute one of these black code provisions that was, after the Civil War, uh, enacted to try and strip uh, uh, free blacks of, of their guns. And one of the planters stands up and says, well, um, you know, his slaves had, had guns for defense of the plantation before the war, and he doesn't see why, now that they're free, they couldn't have them uh, after the war. Um, now, he was voted down, and, and, and his, his colleagues, you know, went forward with, with their, their, their uh, um, gun confiscation. But but the, the the episode demonstrates that all of, of you know that this experience is just far far richer than our, our kind of you know stereotype of of the era. So almost uh, you know any kind of variation on the theme that you can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, you can find some sort of, of evidence for. Now I don't want to suggest that that was you know the full blown practice. What I do in the book is to use that episode as a suggestion of, of one of the other places where slaves were getting access to guns and. and how to show how uh, easy it might have been for slaves under some circumstances uh, to see uh, to steal guns and to use them uh, in in their their efforts to flee. Talking with uh, Professor Nicholas Johnson, and I do have to say, Professor, I thought, and you actually point that out at one point in the book that you know these are stories of individuals. We are talking at the end of the day about an individual right uh, to keep and bear arms for, and you talk to. You go to an NRA annual meeting and you start talking to people about why they own firearms and, and what they use them for, and you're going to hear a lot of different stories. Uh, so I, I, I actually really appreciated you pointing out that, uh, you know, while this is a, a history and it is a history of uh, the black tradition of firearms, this history is comprised of uh, millions of, of stories, and, and, and this is just even a small sampling of of, of so many voices that, uh, that, that are out there and whose stories are still waiting to be told. That's right, and and I say in the book, and it's it's one of the reasons that I that I think uh, people who who have read it have have liked is that they find so many uh, really really surprising episodes. And one of the places uh, in, in one of the chapters, I I sort I end the chapter uh, by by commenting basically on that fact, and and uh, you know essentially say that you know any kind of of cultural phenomenon uh, like like this is is ultimately you know the compilation of of just countless the stories of countless. In individuals um, whose whose decisions and actions uh, ultimately frame a kind of, of, of narrative and we can talk in in broad terms about that narrative but um, this is a place where it's important to to appreciate that that individual choice on on these questions and you know a choice is something that, that we um, uh, we elevate in lots of other contexts but uh, individual choice on how one is going to face what may be you know the biggest crisis of, of, of your life Life is is central to um, the the stories running through this book. It's uh, you know central to uh, the 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 individual right that we see um, you know affirmed in in the Second Amendment and also in um, you know the the other part of the book that tells another important story is that um, once you get past the Second Amendment conversation, uh, one of the things the book talks about in detail is the conversation that people were having surrounding the Fourteenth Amendment, which quite explicitly was. Um, aimed at extending the the, the privileges uh, and, and immunities of citizenship to to blacks, and there is there's there's just a ton of material uh, in that context that shows that uh, that that you know the the radical reconstructionists, that free blacks, um, um, that that uh, uh, Freedmen's Bureau agents and and uh, many others were were aiming to ensure that freed slaves, that freemen had a right to arms for individual protection. And, and you, you just don't find any uh, conversation there about uh, uh, militias or federalism or mm -hmm. any of those things. So uh, it, it really very much tracks the kind of uh, statements that we saw, for example, in, in McDonald versus uh, Chicago when the Supreme Court uh, was engaging the question of the right to arms in the context of the 14th Amendment. I mean, it, it's the place where we see uh, just some of the strongest affirmations of the individual nature of uh, the, the U.S. constitutional right to arms. 
terms. A- absolutely. Uh, and again, I think it's, you know, it's, you get the feeling, Professor, that it's a little embarrassing to progressives uh, that, 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 you know, they were at one time the progressive side was actually on the side of the right to keep and bear arms and the side of individuals uh, being able to protect themselves and their families because they knew that the government couldn't do that for them. You know, it's, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's always hard for me to answer you know, those sorts of questions. I, mean, I, I don't know that I, I, I work with, with lots of people who are, are you know, really uh, politically progressive. I don't, right. I don't have the, uh, I, I don't know if people are, are embarrassed. I mean, well, uh, to, it's interesting you, you, you use the term. Uh, years ago, uh, one of the, one of the, the most uh, powerful uh, academic treatments of the Second Amendment was written by a fellow named Sandy Levinson, and mm-hmm. he wrote an article in the Yale Law Review called uh, the embarrassing Second Amendment, and I guess uh, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to or not, but it, you maybe some consciously reminded yeah. me of it. And and I guess he sort of suggested something like that in in the sense that um, that that we had this this constitutionalism out there that was working so very hard to create individual rights in certain contexts, and and it seemed like it was working just as hard in the opposite direction to to diminish the individual right to arms, and and uh, that actually you know, prompted uh, some some work that I did uh, uh, years later, uh, comparing the the jurisprudence of, of of abortion rights to to the then uh, sort of dormant jurisprudence of um, of, of gun rights, and uh, at the very end of the book, actually, um, the, uh, you know, I'll, the, the the ending. You know, here I'll give away the ending. It's, it's, it's not, the ending is not a big deal. It's the meat in the middle that's important. But at the, at the end of the book, um, uh, I suggest that on policy questions, that people consider how much this comes down to choice. And I actually have a quote from uh, one of the Supreme Court's op- uh, opinions, uh, talking about the importance of choice in in uh, the most important matters that, that uh, people have to evaluate in their lives. Uh, well, that quote actually comes from uh, the Casey decision, which is, is one of the court's uh, abortion, abortion rights uh, decisions. Uh, but w- what I've argued, what, you know, what I suggest at the end of the book, and what I've argued in a couple of long law review treatments is, is something like what Sanford Levinson, I think, was, was talking about uh, probably you know, almost 20 years ago now, and that is that the, the Bill of Rights is not a buffet. You can't go with with a sort of uh, uh, a really aggressive lens, looking to expand rights from uh, from the First Amendment, and then uh, change lenses and decide that you're going to put on a really stingy kind of uh, do a really stingy kind of treatment when you get to the Second Amendment, get to the Fourth Amendment, and decide you like that one again, and then treat uh, uh, use use a different standard for evaluating uh, rights claims in that context. You know, if, if we're going to be uh, you know a society of laws, and we're really going to uh, claim objectivity in the way that we evaluate the uh, individual rights claims, uh, we've got to take rights seriously, and, and that means uh, a kind of uh, no pain, no gain analysis. That is, if, if you've got a theory of constitutionalism that only gives you everything you want and uh, causes everything you don't want to disappear, then it's just a, a sort of, of, of random uh, assessment. It's very hard to say that that's based on principle. So uh, one of the things that, that I would argue, and I think Levin and argued uh, in, in you know, 1990, 1991, whenever he uh, uh, put that, whenever he wrote that that uh, article, was that that we we can't treat, or we shouldn't, or that it's a mistake to tr- try to treat the, the Bill of Rights uh, as a buffet, and that that we should take the same degree of of, of effort and care and and nurturing uh, and bring it to bear on Second Amendment questions um, and 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 abortion questions and all kind you know you pick your right and, and decide how far how much you're going to press for the uh, the the uh, elevation of that right. Um, you ultimately have to think, well, it's legitimate for people to do the very same thing on, on the other provisions of the Bill of Rights. Talking right now with uh, Nicholas Johnson, law professor at uh, Fordham University, author of the new book, Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. Professor, uh, I could talk to you for another hour uh, about this book. Uh, well, I'm happy we, to be here. Well, we only have a, about six minutes or so left, so um, let me... Let's talk about um, the end of the book, where you uh, you, you lay out your, I, I think how you reached your decision on where you stand on uh, uh, the the gun control sure. uh, movement, and you know one of the things that you and I have in common uh, 
uh, I think, is the acknowledgement that there's a very small number of Americans who are responsible for a very large amount of crime in this country. Right. Uh, and supply-side gun control laws, as you put it, really don't touch those folks. Um, you know, the FBI has said that perhaps uh, in, in some uh, urban areas, 80 percent of violent crime is committed by 20 percent of, of the gang population. If there right. are 1.2 million gang members in this country, we may be talking about 250 or 300,000 individuals across the entirety of the United States of America. Yep. Uh, and, and so I, I, get the, I, I get the sense that, 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 that you think it makes sense to really get intensive and to focus on those folks because law enforcement knows who these guys are typically. The community knows who these guys are because they're the ones raising hell and, and tearing down these communities. Um, and, and so it is actually possible to, to focus uh, on these individuals and to see a disproportionate drop in violent crime. Well, and, and, you know, it's important here not to overpromise, but, right. but you're, you're absolutely right, first, that uh, when we look at the, the numbers, uh, we know for sure that we're talking about really a sort of microculture of, of violence. So one of the things that big sweeping gun controls uh, do is sort of suggest that the entire community is, is, is uh, untrustworthy, which, you know, is, is worrisome. But you also end up with uh, a, you know, an elimination of the, the disincentives that that uh, a solid armed population of trustworthy people uh, have uh, to, to or present when you're thinking about crime control. So you lose that as well. And then the question is, so uh, are you really having an impact on <clears throat> what turns out to be quite clearly uh, a, a relatively a, a handful of, of uh, basically violent young men? Uh, and the answer there is, well, you're not really getting uh, at their gun supply because they are uh, if, if they're underage, then clearly you know they can't own uh, a handgun. If the tr if they they track what we know generally about these men, that uh, they already have uh, um, the, the consistently long uh, uh, criminal records. Um, and the you know the book talks about you know I haven't done this empirical work, but I, I read try to read uh, and digest all of the empirical work. Uh, so so what we're talking about are are people who have um, engaged in a criminal lifestyle for for quite a long time. So the idea that they're getting firearms from uh, legitimate sources uh, is false. There is the background worry um, that they're going to get access to firearms from these sources, that is through theft and borrowing, and that raises serious concerns in, in uh, communities where um, uh, keeping guns uh, safe and away from those who are not authorized is, is, is an important and is, is a high-level concern. But there, there are other things that are going on that are important for people to recognize. So uh, you know, there, there's there's another book out there by uh, a guy named David Kennedy. I forget the name of it. Uh, but it's he called talks Stop Sh or Don't Shoot. I yeah, yeah. Yep. He talks about the inception of uh, Project Exile, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, it's it's also worth a read. And well, you know, one of the sad things about it is that that he recounts how the, the sort of the political process uh, diminished the effectiveness of of the program in places where he was observing it, uh, observing it firsthand. You know, just questions about uh, who was going to get the credit, uh, and if it didn't work, who was going to get the blame. Yeah. Um, there, there are other things. You know, people have asked me. You know, so, so is, is your solution here that everybody should have guns? And w what I'm suggesting is that this is a very narrow slice of of the problem. So, what I'm suggesting in the book, ultimately, as a matter of policy, is that we are better off giving uh, the sober, mature members of the black community, people like Otis McDonald, people like Shelley Parker. Who were, were plaintiffs driving the, uh, the the Heller case and the McDonald case, giving them access to to legitimate uh, legally owned firearms, and that. Uh, that is is one slice of uh, what turns out to be uh, a, a, a much larger kind of of uh, mosaic. So uh, there, there's a fellow named Jeffrey Canada, for example, who runs something called the Harlem Children's Zone. And if you're looking for sort of hope and up, uplift and, and a kind of, of recipe for uh, keeping people off of the track that has, has generated uh, some of the, the stories and some of the uh, scenarios that we're talking about in the background here, um, that strikes me as, as just a, a sort of phenomenal kind of, of initiative. So the, the question of gun policy is, is ultimately, for people who are looking at the, the uh, community, 
in in a broader sense. Uh, gun policy is is one strand of mm-hmm. um, a much more complicated set of of uh, conversations. Uh, but what what seems to me to be uh, fairly clear is that the utility of taking firearms away from people like Otis McDonald and Shelley Parker is is almost nil in terms of generating the things that we're hoping to generate f- uh, through through uh, supply side gun control, which is 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 diminishing uh, gun crime and and uh, sort of senseless gun violence. So uh, I understand the appeal of it politically, but my, my I was telling someone the other day it strikes me as sort of the same thing as, as looking for your keys under the under the street light, even though you know you lost them in the dark. That is, you do the easy thing because you can have a press conference and uh, say that you've you've done something that that is effective. But in terms of getting at the people that are are actually uh, the ones we are most worried about, uh, supply controls are, um, and I've done lots of, of work on this. Professor, we uh, gotta go. Controls Professor, are, are a distraction. Professor, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Professor Nicholas Johnson, Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms.